Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to Smart Logic's webinar, Building Ontologies for Knowledge Discovery. My name is Ann Kelly, and I'll host this webinar today. And I have two great speakers. Uh, first of all, our partner, Heather Hedden. Um, many of you probably know her as the accidental taxonomist, or you've read her book. Um, Heather's a Smart Logic partner, and she's also a taxonomy consultant and trainer for Hedden Information Management. And our second speaker is someone you all probably know as well, Jim Morris, who's a senior information science consultant here at Smart Logic. Um, Jim has done many webinars with us. Um, you've probably seen him at uh, library and knowledge management conferences as he presents pretty often there as well. And with that, oh, I'm sorry, a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to the speakers. First of all, this webinar is in broadcast mode and you are all muted. Um, if you have a question and we encourage questions, please put them in the GoToWebinar panel, which you should see on the right-hand side of your screen. We have about 40 to 45 minutes worth of content this morning, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. And finally, this broadcast is being recorded, and everyone who's registered for this webinar will receive playback information tomorrow afternoon. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Heather. Okay, thank you. So this is our outline, and um, I'm going to start off talking about what are ontologies and building ontologies. In the middle of that, we're going to switch over to Jim, and then we'll switch back. I'll talk about sources on, for ontologies, and we'll switch, switch back to Jim talking about using ontologies. So what are ontologies? Well, let's back it up a little bit um, within the context of a knowledge model. Now, there are different perspectives to ontologies. It's also a concept in, in philosophy and computer science, but in uh, information and knowledge management, we think of ontologies as knowledge models. And actually, I gave a presentation uh, with Jim last year talking more about what knowledge models are. So, um, a knowledge model describes the entities, the things in an organization, uh, and if in a domain for a project, okay, because that's kind of how you scope it. And it comprises concepts and their labels, their metadata attributes and relationships, and also the rules for usage too. So model is, 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 is a little bit bigger than just what's there. We have policies and, and um, governance as well. So it could be a thesaurus or a taxonomy, usually a set of taxonomies or an ontology. Uh, so in this uh, context of um, taxonomy, thesaurus, ontology, these uh, are called knowledge organization systems. And perhaps if you have some attended some sessions uh, or webinars or presentations or, or read about controlled vocabularies or knowledge organization systems, you've seen this table or chart that shows different ones from their simplest to their most complex, simple term lists, and then uh, synonym rings bring in synonyms, name authorities are for proper nouns, named entities where there are variants and other um, uh, attributes. A taxonomy brings in hierarchical relationships. A thesaurus also has associative relationships and the synonym control. And sometimes we'll see an ontology over on the further right, it has the most complexity because instead of just hierarchical and associative relationships, it has semantic relationships. That semantic means has meaning, so the relations are customized and uh, you can create them for whatever meaning you want, and then it's between sets of concepts that are grouped by classes. But there is another way to think about ontologies, and that's actually as a, a layer, a model on top, because it includes uh, taxonomies and other um, control vocabularies. Actually, usually maybe not necessarily just a simple term list, but let's say a name, authority, a taxonomy, possibly even a, a thesaurus. And uh, this specifies relations between different, between a named authority and a taxonomy, between a taxonomy and thesaurus, and so forth. Okay, so back to uh, ontologies defining, go a little more specific here. So we saw that it can be a type of knowledge organization system uh, that could be a more complex type or an abstract layer uh, describing um, a knowledge organization system. It's sometimes described as a no knowledge representation. And uh, as I started out in my first slide, it's a kind of knowledge model. Uh, more specifically, it's the formal naming and definition of the types, properties, and interrelationships of entities in a particular domain. 
uh, getting a little more specific on characteristics. And, I'm, and just again, this is from the perspective of control vocabularies. So when I talk about concepts, uh, that's not actually in um, ontology language and terminology. They don't really talk about concepts. That's something we talk about when we talk about control vocabularies or knowledge organization systems. But you can still talk about them in an ontology. So there are concepts and concepts have attributes and concepts belong to classes, that's groups of them, based on having shared attributes or typed shared characteristics. And then classes have semantic relations between them. And those relation types are inherited by the concepts within the class. Uh, optionally, there may be an ability to support linked data across different ontologies, but I'm, I'm not gonna get into that so much. So let's look at, at these characteristics. But just before I go further, I just want to say that uh, ontologies can be very generic or more specific. The most generic are kind called upper or core ontologies, um, uh, just kind of a very basic model, and then more specific ones uh, for different domain areas. And I, I will talk about some of these later. But an ontology, therefore, um, the definition is, is a little bit fluid because some when we go back to that first you know, knowledge organization systems, that it's uh, it could be the, the abstract model, but it could also be including all the specific terms of a taxonomy within it too. So sometimes I talk, an ontology means not just the, the generic model, but all the specific uh, taxonomy entities. So let's look uh, at the uh, characteristics. So an example, and I say domain ontology, so it's a little bit specific here. We, we've defined classes. A class can be country, organization, employee, and then the customized semantic relations that are between them, between country and organization is uh, the country is home of an organization and the inverse relation is the organization is headquartered in the company. Or between organization and employee, it's a different uh, relationship that the organization employs the employees and employees are employed by the organization. And this is again inherited by the specific instances. Uh, let's look a little bit on standards because you will hear about that. Um, so for ontologies, there's something called the web ontology language and the acronym is a, not exactly an acronym, OWL. It's easier to say and it has a nice logo. Uh, it's from the World Wide Web Consortium and uh, it's defined as a semantic web language. Uh, designed to represent rich and complex knowledge about things. Remember, these are the concepts, entities, groups of things, classes, and relations between things. Uh, it, but what's nice about being part of the semantic web, it provides a way to link data, all right, and the, the, the link data on the web. Uh, you can choose to make use of that, or you don't have to. But it's nice, you can bring in content too. You don't, if you don't wanna share yours, you can bring in from the outside. Um, it's a, as far as language goes, it's a computer readable language and a declarative language, but it's not a programming language. So since that enables linking on the semantic web. And then it's based on some other um, W3C uh, standards or guidelines, RDF and RDFS, uh, which I'll get to in the next slide, um, that OWL is, um, sort of extension of RDFS, that's a resource description framework schema. So resource description framework, RDF, uh, predated um, OWL, it's a little more basic uh, and uh, more generic. So it's more of a, just a standard model of data interchange. It's not quite as specific for ontologies, but it's what ontologies are based on. An important key part of it is having URIs, uniform resource identifiers, to specify the things and to specify the relations too. The relations also have URIs. Um, and if it, this facilitates data merging and um, others, even if underlying schemas differ. And then there's this uh, model, as I said, is it, it it's called a triple because there are three parts to it, a subject, predicate, object. And the subject and object are things and the predicate is a relation between them. So let's look at an example of a triple. Um, so we have uh, a subject, uh, Rome, Italy, and object, Italy, and the predicate, because this is going one direction, it's the capital city of Italy, but this can go in the other direction as well. So this, what's the subject? So the concept can be a subject or an object depending on the relation. So the subject could be Italy and it has the capital city of Rome. 
Okay, so let's look at some more um, basic components in OWL. Uh, there are classes, individuals, and properties. Properties, And classes uh, would be subject or object. These are also called domain or range. The subject is the domain and object is range. And it's important to be familiar with that language because the tools you use, such as Semaphore, will, will use that language. Uh, and it may contain individuals, instances of class, and other subclasses. Classes are sets of concepts that sh have shared characteristics and shared relations, relationships. Uh, if you think of other knowledge organization systems, if you've worked with taxonomies or ontology or, or thesauri, a class is the same as the, the top, uh, like the top level, um, you know, your top term in a taxonomy, or it's called a concept scheme or a top concept or actually really any concept with narrower concepts. Then individuals, like classes, could be subjects or objects, domains or ranges of RDF triples, uh, but they're, they're more specific, so they would correspond to you know, members of, of um, a class or specific concepts in a knowledge organization system. And then properties, um, these are the predicates of RDF triples, and there are two very distinct kind of properties. The ones that are relationships that we, we looked at between you know, employed and employed by, but also attributes, which are characteristics or metadata of, um, of classes and, and individuals. And uh, so that might be a little confusing because they in, that now uses the same idea of properties for both, uh, whereas they, they are a little bit different. Okay, so enough about that talk, let's look about building ontologies. Uh, and it's, um, you know, it's good to use a tool such as Semaphore to build ontologies because it is it is a little too complex to do on a spreadsheet. <laughs> I know we use spreadsheets for just taxonomies uh, sometimes when we start out. And, um, and it's important that then it's also interoperable. It's in the uh, standards of SCOS RDFS, OWL. SCOS is Simple Knowledge Organization System, also a W3C standard for control vocabularies. Now, you, I mentioned that there are upper core, very generic ontologies, and you might consider starting with that, although you don't have to. But here, step three, the knowledge modeling. And that's why, I mean, I think it's, it's nice to call ontologies not knowledge models, because there's this task of knowledge modeling that is really very I like doing it. <laughs> it's very interesting. You try to figure out how are you going to name things and what you're going to identify. So you start out by identifying the scope and identifying the various classes of you know big groups of things. So people can be a class, places is a class, organizations is a class, products is a class, and it is an example. And then you figure out what are the relations between the classes. You know, the people live in places or they work in places or whatever, or they're affiliated with organizations, organizations produce products and that type of thing. Uh, and then attributes, you know, what would you want to say characteristics about people that are not too private? <laughs> okay, places you might have uh, longitude and latitude, organizations, you could have things about their address and products, whatever. No, characteristics and numbers and colors and <laughs> features. Uh, and then that's again on the generic level and then you get into creating the specific instances within each class. So that's actually going beyond the ontology and this is where you're combining an ontology with the specifics of a taxonomy. Now the taxonomy might already exist. You're taking it, you, you have a taxonomy already and you're extending it to an ontology or you are you could be creating it at the same time as an integrated project, the taxonomy and, and the whole knowledge model, and that's fine as well. Okay, so a little more specific on the knowledge modeling. I mentioned you identify the classes. All right, and how do you do this? You need to think about what's specific enough for your business needs, but generic enough so that they include a, a variety of um, specific instances in it and not to make it more complicated than necessary. I mean, you know, these are kind of vague guidelines, but uh, it's something you know, when you get into it, you realize it's it's an issue. So let's look at an, an exam another example here um, on space missions. So we would define classes for astronaut, mission, and spacecraft, and maybe others, but that's a good starting point. 
we'll extend that example further. Uh, then relations between classes. So as I mentioned, Al considers relations as properties. Uh, relations are between pairs of classes, although you can, of course, extend that further to another one, but the, it's a unique relationship pair between a certain uh, pair of classes. And you go from the domain, uh, which is a subject, to the range, the object. And I said that can, that will switch, you know, in one direction, one class is the object and one is the uh, subject and one is the object and then, and then they switch in the other direction. And the relations are relevant or inherited by all the instances within the class. So each named individual astronaut accrues each na um, individual named mission. And uh, the these relations are typically bidirectional. That means with the inverse. It's not actually required by uh, ontology standards, but it's usually done and, and I would certainly recommend it. Okay, so that's the, um, the okay, we talked about classes, relations, and then the third thing, remember, attributes. Okay, so specify the attributes for the class. Uh, and the simple properties for a, they are simple properties for a specific class. And again, just what you need for business needs. I mean, do we need to know um, the astronauts, uh, place of birth probably not you know birth date is good to know but place is probably not so we don't don't include that um, and then it's applicable to every instance within the class so i have here some examples of uh, classes that are assigned i mean sorry, attributes that are assigned to these three different classes all right you know it one of the issues in creating ontologies i've, I've confronted is that sometimes you it's not even sure should something be an attribute or yet another class because you could even have a, a controlled vocabulary of attributes uh, birth date wouldn't be but um, some some others might be um, so let's think of launch vehicle would be a good good example um, so now that could be a class or maybe it should just be an attribute on mission so you need to figure out is it necessary is, is it going to be point of users need to connect directly to the data do they are they looking up launch vehicles and they want to find the launch vehicles or it's it's more of just an attribute on mission so that that will depend okay and then we can go further this i maybe you heard me mention subclass yes so um some of these attributes are if they're very generic you can take them a step up and especially if your knowledge model includes is is more types of classes. So an astronaut is a person. And if you had other people too involved in space missions, like people who worked in mission control and they were important to include, then it, it would be useful to have a, 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 a main class of a person and then astronaut actually is a subclass and you can inherit some of these attributes like birth date. Although you can still have other attributes specific to the specific subclass as well. Okay, um, all right, I think now it's time for me to turn it over to Jim, who's gonna uh, show a little bit about how this might be done in Semaphore and give some more examples. Okay, thanks, Heather. I will grab the right screen here. Move this over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to, for those not already familiar with uh, Semaphore, I thought I would just recap what it is and, and, and why it exists. Uh, Semaphore is a, uh, a tool, it's really about, you know, making more, it's about knowledge discovery, which is, of course, the title of this uh, webinar. And what do we mean by knowledge discovery? Why do you need to discover knowledge? Well, it's really about making more effective decisions, really having the right information to make the decisions uh, as effective and efficient as possible. So Semaphore is built around three main capabilities to support this. One is everything we've been talking about, building and managed semantic models. This is the, uh, the heart uh, of Semaphore. And we really place an emphasis on end user uh, subject matter expert usability. So we make this tool as easy uh, to use as possible. Uh, we simplify the um, development, the customization, the ingestion, and, and the 
uh, distribution of the models. And we like to say that we put the models to work. Uh, they're fantastic to build, but how do you actually apply them uh, to your information? And for that, we have our second component, which is really about taking the models and generating uh, uh, text analytic, uh, text analysis and um, natural language processing rules that can go into text and even, that, even if that text is a single word and be able to say, well, what, what is a, the normalization of this word? Uh, what does it actually mean? What, what concept is it actually representing uh, to looking at an entire document or a, a paragraph and saying, well, what is this actually about? You know, and what it's about may not even be mentioned specifically in the text. And the text may contain even more information, some uh, specific facts. It might make assertions about relationships between things, the price of something or the weight of something or uh, who did what, uh, who requires uh, what training. You know, those types of um, triples, essentially, that you're looking for uh, in text. That's what this component of Semaphore does. And as I mentioned before, it's really about making this, making the, uh, the knowledge models, the ontologies, the taxonomies usable and consumable. Because there's a lot you can do with semantic models, just making them available to a, uh, to a broader audience and making them uh, easily integrated into downstream systems like uh, menus or uh, uh, search uh, uh, assistance. And this, uh, it's gonna, I'm going to take it one step further here. And, and, uh, and of course, well, I should mention Semaphore is really about delivering these capabilities at enterprise scale. All our components are intended to scale to whatever type of power you need, like for especially this middle capability of being able to look at millions of documents uh, and be able to assess uh, specific uh, facts, entities, concepts that are in these uh, documents or, or text in a, in a reasonable time frame. So again, why are we doing this? You know, what is the challenge in, uh, in, in enterprises um, well, you hear a lot these days the concept of a knowledge graph. So I wanted to put semaphore in the in the context of a uh, some and ontologies in general in in the in the con in the uh, context of the knowledge graph. And you know how do, how do we is this usually um, uh, uh, proceed? It's usually we start with the data, the data in databases that organizations have. They want to uh, pull it into a data lake, and and they think uh, you know perhaps that will create a graph of, of knowledge. Well, it's just data and it may be very uh, inconsistent. So we might apply an ontology. And these ontologies might be managed in semaphore. And we might we can look at this data, clean the data, make it consistent, add additional metadata to it to, un to understand what it is, uh, what the field values are, what the values in the in the columns are. Um, but and that sometimes that's not enough. I and mean, that's kind of gets back to this other part of semaphore where we really are focused on text. And, and what and the, the data that is locked in documents, uh, you know, like some some studies say it's 70, 80 percent of the actual data that a company needs is still in documents. So Semaphore has this as our vision, right? We're, we're, it's all this stuff, the ontologies we manage, the data from documents, the data from your databases, they all can form a graph. I mean, knowledge, how do we know anything? We connect things from different places and and through that uh, understanding of the graph and traversing if you will of the graph that's how we understand that something that might seem completely unrelated uh, is related to something else and that's new knowledge that you want to uh, capture and I, you know and i also mentioned that sometimes the 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 key to connecting that data again it's back in the documents that's not data that you're expecting to you know use because it's not in some kind of so-called structured form so i wanted to just leave you with that uh, idea of the knowledge graph and where semaphore fits in it. So let's go back to Heather's example and let's run through uh, creating it in semaphore. So uh, again, just recapping what Heather went through, uh, when we, we're gonna use our space missions example again, and here's the class structure uh, that Heather uh, presented and um, Again, with our inheritance of birth data being inherited down to the astronaut and so forth, and and then we were also talking about how um, it might need to be more specific. Uh, you know, it, and it all depends on your use case. 
you know, the, you know, the right level of, you know, um, you know, formalization or, you know, not making it more complicated than it needs to be, but saying, well, what am I looking for in my tech? Suppose I'm NASA. NASA is actually one of our uh, early uh, clients. And we have all these engineering documents and I'm looking for not just astronauts. I mean, that's useful. But I'm looking for specific astronauts. I'm looking for spe information about specific missions. So that's why we're adding more of a, a taxonomical uh, representation of that. Well, these are actually instances. There's only one Neil Armstrong in this context, uh, only one Apollo 11. So these are, so we're modeling these instances as concepts that belong to these classes. And this is really cool because it, it, you can take advantage of all the, uh, the power that's, it, that's built into like an ontological framework like this as you're creating classes. So we're gonna look at how we create a model like this that shows uh, we're managing all these different relationships about a particular uh, concept. Uh, so this is where I jump over to here. Uh, this is Semaphore. This is Semaphore version five. And you can see Semaphore is represented by these same three capabilities I was talking about earlier. We're gonna focus on the modeling uh, component. So let me just open up our models. And you can see just as an introduction, uh, we have several ways to manage models. We have a, 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 a lot of inventory capabilities. Um, you can have um, uh, several models. Uh, you can categorize them, tag them, organize them in different ways. And uh, Heather alluded to this earlier that, that these are Semaphore uses entirely linked data uh, semantic web standards. So these can all be linked together and be interchanged. All these can have different governance models, different users that can be published downstream in different ways. Uh, very flexible in that way. I'm going to go to a kind of a, a smaller model and it's called uh, About Space Missions. And I'm just going to show you some examples. Um, this is the kind of the workflow component of Semaphore. So you, in terms of man, you can uh, uh, push tasks out to uh, specific people to uh, to make changes to the to a model without affecting the master. Uh, that's what this is all about. And I'm going to go directly into the structure. And this is the ontology, the kind of formal ontology part of Semaphore. And if we look in here, I've I've got a couple concepts uh, created. We've got our, I'm not going to create the entire model that we have there, but we can have, you know, mission, person, uh, vehicle. And we can see person uh, has the subclass of astronaut. And if we go to person, uh, we can see that there is no birth date. So I'm going to add that. But let's look at some of the other properties. Uh, we've looked at the relationships between things um, in terms of, you know, astronauts crewing missions, spacecrafts, uh, belonging to missions. And we have a set of metadata in here as well, talking about uh, uh, this is where we'll add birth date and, and some of the other properties. Now notice there's a lot more going on here than just those classes. And Heather is gonna, is gonna talk a little bit more about SCOS later because this is kind of built, we're using a number of ontologies actually just in this part of Semaphore. It's an OWL ontology, it's built underneath the SCOS framework. Uh, so there's, uh, and of course RDFS is the, and, and RDF is the foundation of the entire, all the information we're looking at. So we'll talk about the value of that. But for person, I'm just gonna do something real quick and create a, uh, that, that birth date metadata, just to show what that looks like. See, the, here's the domain and range that we were just talking about. I'm not going to add the, the uh, birth date to an astronaut. I want it to be relevant to all uh, people of a uh, person class. So I've got the birth date there. I'll just save that. So now if we look at uh, back at our classes and we look at person, we can see birth date is now a concept uh, property of um, I'm just going to use this this pointer here. <laughs> you can see the birth date is a property of a person, but it's also now a property of um, of astronaut. 
and I didn't have to add that separately. It's just, just there. Now, whenever I add any astronaut semaphore, this value will be a valid value, but it's not valid for any other um, class because it's not part of that same class hierarchy. Right? It doesn't all roll up to the same superclass. All these other properties do roll up to the superclass of semaphore, which is these concept classes. Uh, so let's go to, uh, so that's our, that's the, the class structure. That's the first part of that model. But as we've been talking about, we don't want, we don't, that's not just what we're talking about. It's not the, just these classes of things that we're modeling. It's, it's actual instances that we're trying to represent. So when I go into that part of semaphore, you see, I've got part of this uh, built already and I'm going to add astronauts. You can see we've already got the uh, missions. I just want to do this because I want to get to the point where we're adding that birth date, and you can see some of the and some of the other properties. Um, I don't, I'm not worried about modeling people. I'm not going to model every person in the world. I'm just going to model astronauts. And I've got some astronauts in a document over here, so I am going to. Just click on this. Some of where it's a lot of, like I talked about ease of use. We really focus on that. We have a lot of little tricks and capabilities for um, making this as efficient as possible. I'm going to just put these in here. These are all astronauts. So I'm giving in the class. Here's our ontology classes. I'm going to make uh, these guys all astronauts. And now something, some very interesting things are kind of built into the model. For example, uh, I know astronauts uh, are, uh, uh, they crew missions, right? So if we go to uh, Neil Armstrong here, and I want to say, what uh, mission did he crew? Notice I can't crew uh, another mission. So I'm sorry, yeah, I can't crew another astronaut uh, uh, because that's not a valid According to the class structure and the domain and range of those relationships, this isn't it isn't valid to have a uh, an astronaut uh, in that same relationship with another astronaut or any other concept that has to be it's specific to uh, the, the class hierarchy that it's that we've defined. So we can make a uh, meal associated with Apollo 11. Uh, if I go to Apollo 11, I can do this a different way. I can just take uh, Buzz. And uh, oops, I can't really buzz to buzz. That's something I meant to do. I can make buzz related to uh, Apollo 11. And same with Michael Collins, uh, but I'll leave it there. So now the last thing I wanted to do was look at Neil Armstrong and let's add his birth date. We can't add birth dates to uh, Apollo missions. We can only add them to people. So if I add the metadata, I have the birth date here. So remember, astronauts don't have explicit birth dates. It's the person class that has the birth date. And that's why we're seeing it there. Now, I don't remember what Neil Armstrong's birth date is, honestly, but I do have uh, another capability of Semaphore to jump out to other external sources and quickly look up information. And, and I can see here that uh, his birth date is this. So I'm just going to pull that in. And now I've got that. So I've added concept classes to help define, they help really structure um, um, the model and provide integrity to the model because uh, ontologies have a lot of integrity. They're, they're formal in their structure. So uh, that's a good thing in this case. Um, it can be limiting in other cases, which we'll uh, talk about later. I have a fully baked version of this model. And I just wanted to show you that quickly. Uh, this is our, our full space missions model, and you can see it's completely fleshed out as soon as this paints. And if we look at Apollo 11, you can see we have this full um, representation of Apollo 11. And, and this is, you know, uh, one of the reasons we focus on this type of model is we really care about how things are represented in your information, in your text, in your documents, in your data. So it's very important, like how what things are called, 
uh, what things, how they relate to each other. And it's, that's kind of more of a, 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 an area of thesauri or, or taxonomies, whereas ontologies are more about, you know, what is the nature of a thing? Uh, what, what defines an astronaut? We're here, we're actually talking about, well, how, do we, how are we gonna find the concept of Apollo 11 in our content? That's what this is all focused on. And once we have this, you know, fingerprint of what Apollo 11 is about, we can really, um, you know, navigate, navigate this information uh, really effectively. I, um, one of the things I wanted to show you really quickly about making use of these models downstream, this is something that comes with Semaphore. It's a visualizer uh, that allows you to put your model very, with a push of a button, literally. This, this can be made available to anybody in your organization. And it's real nice because I can quickly zero in on uh, the concepts I'm looking for. Um, And here I see that same hierarchy. It's very easy to navigate around. I can go to where the launch site was. I can see all these, all these, all these other uh, missions launched from the same site. And oh look, the Crew Dragon, which just uh, completed their mission, uh, is in here as well. They launched from the same site as Apollo 11. That's kind of cool. Um, I'm gonna go back to this. I wanna show you one more thing. This is really about distributing these models downstream. It's all about making them useful. Now, the other part we haven't touched much on is how do we make them useful in terms of discovering um, new, uh, new knowledge? Let's take a document. Now, you look at this document, there's no, how do we know, I'm gonna tell you, it's about Apollo 11, <laughs> but how do we know that? We can read this and know that because we have an innate well, and that's not an eight. We have a knowledge, especially if you're, you know, in in my generation, uh, that uh, about Apollo 11, we can look at this and know based on the evidence. Remember that all this was in our model. So we've modeled what we know about Apollo 11. So now the computer, the machine can look at this document and say, oh, I know it's about Apollo 11 because nothing else would, it wouldn't be about any other, anything else with all these types of entities found like Sea of Tranquility, Michael Collins. I mean, that alone would define Apollo 11, right? But we can go beyond that and think about not just uh, uh, what this document is about, but what facts it might contain. How many hours did they spend on the lunar surface? Uh, how much, how many pounds of lunar material, moon rocks that they bring back? These are all facts that some of us also designed uh, to go in and get using ontological frameworks that are specifically designed for this, designed for this type of um, what you might call fact extraction. But you, so where do we get these ontologies? We don't have to start from scratch. Um, and, uh, and that's what uh, we're gonna cover next. And I'll turn it back to Heather, thanks. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah, I, just a, a quick side into sources for ontologies if you're not gonna build the entire thing yourself. Um, but I'm going to step back and look at control vocabularies in general, since I, you know, I'm a taxonomist and I talk a lot about taxonomies. And generally, you you want to custom create your own control vocabulary and taxonomy. That's best because it's customized to your particular content and your particular users. Um, exceptions might be if you want to have a taxonomy as a starting point and then develop it further, or sometimes for external content. Um, you, you want to share with something's been already a, you know, a lot of literature has been published and certain subjects or maybe a, a term list within um, a, a faceted taxonomy for a single facet such as uh, geographic places but ontologies are different because they they are this higher level knowledge model so um, it might make more sense to to start with an existing knowledge model whether it's it's very generic or something in a specific domain you're interested in. So um, returning to those different, you know, upper foundation ontologies, and then I said more specific domain ontologies. Uh, these are some examples that you can look at. They're readily available, they're free, there isn't any license involved because they don't have the specifics. I mean, it is, it is very generic. Um, if you look at the bottom of the list, SCOS, that Simple Knowledge Organization System, uh, which is a 
you know, sometimes considered a standard for knowledge organization systems from the World Wide Web. And when I saw this on a list of ontologies, I was kind of like, huh, it's an ontology? I thought it was just an, a standard. But in a certain sense, it is because it, it models the, the, um, the entities and their relations and the aspects of attributes. So let's just look at this in a little more detail. This is the the whole full set of everything that's in SCOS and it has a lot more than we use on a daily basis. <laughs> um, but then, you know, if we, we compare it to what what is in an ontology, yeah, the concepts are classes or individuals and the labels or notations, you know, preferred label, alternative label, et cetera, um, are uh, attributes. And then notes uh, would also be um, considered attributes in uh, an ontology. And then of course there are the relations. I mean, there are standard, sema there are standard semantic relations, but then there are also mapping relations um, and so forth. Okay, and then the next domain ontologies, uh, these you know you might need to license. Um, and there, there are a lot of them, especially in the biomedical and life sciences. You don't, you know, <laughs> there's a lot to model there, and uh, it's important to share that knowledge. And so you don't, definitely, you don't need to build something from scratch. Um, there are a few others here: BBC Ontology and FIBO Financial Industry Business Ontology. I've also looked at that. So you might look, want to look into those. Uh, so where do you go to look into these? <laughs> there are directories of uh, ontologies along with other knowledge organization systems uh, available whether, you know, for license or not. I mean, some are domain specific and some just like cover everything. And I think the one that covers the most, BARTOC, which is an acronym for the Basel Register of Thesauri Ontologies and Classifications. It was started at the uh, Library of Basel in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, but don't worry, it's in English <laughs> um, and other languages. Uh, so this is what it looks like, and you can, you know, here. Well, when I took the screenshot, there are probably over 3,000 now vocabularies in there, and then you can filter on on subject and source and you know everything, and, and including whether it's an ontology or not. So I, I suggest you check into that. Okay, so uh, back to just the subject of of licensing and external vocabularies there are you know there's some issues with licensing taxonomies that we don't have those same issues with ontologies one of them is like what format is it in because taxonomies could be in various different formats and ontologies are in a more standard format rdf i mean there could be some uh different expressions of it but it's that's that's good <laughs> um and that the fact that ontology is a little bit more generic in general makes it uh useful um because it, it's not so specific, like so it doesn't have to be licensed, and then they more ontologies tend to be open source and free than the taxonomies or thesauri for license. And then because ontologies are meant to be models to build out from, that's that's useful. And then uh, whereas if you do find a free license for a taxonomy, maybe that will have a restriction that prohibits you from modifying it. <laughs> I've seen that uh, in the license agreements. You need to credit who you got it from. You know, let's say you're using medical subject headings, you know, you, or something like that. Okay, so that that's um, my little side on um, sources for ontologies, and we'll get back to Jim on uh, using ontologies with some good case studies. He's got he's got more cases than I do. I've got cases from taxonomies, not quite as many on ontologies, <laughs> but hopefully I'll, well, I'll do more work with ontologies. Yeah, well, and I'm going to switch domains from space missions, as exciting that, as that is, to life sciences, um, which is uh, an area that, that's kind of my background in terms of uh, where I spent most of my career in uh, in pharma. So I work with a lot of those types of clients um, here at Smart Logic. So this comes up a lot <laughs> because there are so many ontologies uh, available to life sciences, and it sounds great. You know, oh great, I could just grab these ontologies and my work is done. Well, there's there's more to think about than that. And I just had a have a couple items here to focus, and then we'll look at semaphore again. Um, on all ontologies, uh, even those that are using Al, which is a, a formal language, you can still model uh, Al in, in any way you need to. I mean, different classes, different uh, different attributes, even if they're covering the same topic. You know, if they come from different places, they've modeled them very differently. So it's actually not as straightforward to, to bring them together um, and, and make use of them in your own context. 
And remember, these ontologies are open, are well, they're open, open source or from consortia, and uh, they have a great deal of information, but they're they're very they can be very broad um, and not specific to your interests. Um, so it's you you need that much, you know, how much of that information do you actually need? So it really comes down to you know practical considerations, which I hope is kind of a theme here, is that what how much formalization do you need? Do you need a, 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 a level of ontology that requires um, such uh, disparate sophistication across multiple sources? Or uh, do you need to normalize them so you can actually put them to use? Again, Semaphore's theme, how do you put them to use downstream to classify your content, to identify new information, to drive your user interfaces? And, you, and since they're external, how are you going to keep them current? You know, how are you going to reuse them um, you know, as new versions are published. And so uh, let's jump right into Semaphore. I don't take too much time here. I want to show you, here we are back in the knowledge model management uh, part of Semaphore. And you can see I've, I've selected my biomedical models here. And look at these two on the right, the uh, KEBI, which is a chemicals of biological interest, very uh, well-known uh, chemical um, uh, ontology. Uh, it's based on AL, uh, and it's a, it's a great source uh, for chemicals that you know interact with um, biological uh, uh, organisms. So, uh, and you think about a pharmaceutical company, but what what do they work with? Well, they work with more than just chemicals, but chemicals that impact um, disease, that impact biological uh, organisms. So uh, for curing disease now, so, but they don't have anything about disease. It's just chemical. But what I'm trying to build is a model for my company that talks about what chemicals are we looking at for what diseases? This is fundamental to any uh, pharmaceutical or, or, you know, at a more general level, any research organization. Um, so we've got these great sources of information out here, but they're not relevant to my context, right? So using linked data, I'm going to bring both of these models in. The second one, the NCI thesaurus, uh, is from the National Cancer Institute, but it's a real, it's a good general purpose uh, medical uh, thesaurus. Um, so I brought them both in using linked data, using semantic web standards into something I call the pharma TA model. Let's uh, look at that. A lot of stuff in it. So I've, I, it, it has both of these models. There's our Kebi model and our NCI thesaurus. These models are enormous uh, and a lot of information, a lot of good information. But I'm going to put it into my own context. So I've created a new. Uh, one thing I mentioned: these so these are ontologies. But you see, in in these in their native form, these are all classes. Now here I've, I've, I'm representing them as instances because it's it's just more practical. I can actually make use of these in the same way I made use of my space missions. I can um, interact with them more easily. I can put them in different places. For example, I want to organize them under my research areas. Uh, uh, pharma companies always have organized their business in terms of therapeutic areas. So I might have uh, these uh, you know, cardiovascular rare diseases as, as different uh, organ organizing principles of my business. But you can see I've, I've brought, so, you know, the, the therapy area is cardiovascular and metabolism, because that's how I, that's just how I bundle my projects, right? But I've got these specific disease areas that we're targeting. And if I click on, for example, diabetes mellitus, I am actually jumping inside the NCF, NCI thesaurus and Look at all this information. I didn't have to create this. It already existed. It's already managed by another organization, you know, pretty effectively. So all these synonyms that I that are going to use to to find this information in text or or uh, identify new information is already here. It's got a lot of relationships to to other to genes, etc. Um, the definitions. It's all already here. I've brought it in and put it in my context. I've done a little bit more than that. I've taken this type 2 diabetes. Now, if we go over to our relationships over here, um, we can see I've added some uh, things specific to my business. Now, 
these are actually both our products for uh, diabetes to type 2 diabetes. And this, these examples go across different companies. I just selected these at random from, uh, to, to make this example. So don't read into anything that this is a specific company being represented. But so if I, but if I click on, I, I'm saying that this particular compound or uh, thing is a, is a possible therapy. Let's click on that. Well, now we're in the chemicals of biological interest. Now, because this is a, uh, a substance uh, that's in that ontology, I've got those types of synonyms. So completely different places, to ontologies used from different sources, pulled together and put specifically in my context. And by putting them into this framework, we're, we're able to do that and do things like, just like the space missions, uh, hit a button and have these go downstream. So I can start navigating uh, uh, my model uh, that way. So I can go from research areas to uh, therapeutic areas and down to uh, my therapy area of this, diabetes part two. And here I've got all this other information coming from the NCRSRs and I could just keep going. I could go out and explore every, every connection and, and that's where we're coming back to the knowledge graph, right? So combine this with your data that has been uh, classified or extracted or normalized with ontologies. Get information out of your documents that's locked into your documents. Make that part of your knowledge graph. Then you're really into uh, creating uh, new uh, information that helps you make uh, smarter decisions. And I'll leave you with this. You know, when we think of where semaphore fits in this space, it covers uh, the span of all kinds of solutions. So no matter where uh, an organization is in their semantic journey, if you will, uh, we manage reference data, you know, taxonomies and, and, and things like that are, are great, just sources of truth for your organization's business. But as you throw in more capabilities about the, defining the aboutness of documents, enhancing your catalog, data with business concepts, uh, 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 classifications of, of security and regulations, um, extracting data, doing that type of analysis that brings you all the way to this, uh, uh, this uh, able to do that type of um, analysis that gives you, uh, you know, new information. So I hope that's inspiring. <laughs> I, I think this is the field that is uh, really going to change things and, and make a big difference to um, to how we uh, how we think and learn. Now turn it back over to Anne for the. Uh, Thanks, Jim. Do you have any questions? Thanks. Yep. Thanks, Jim and Heather for a great webinar. We have time for some questions, and I do have a lot of questions. I'm going to answer the one that I got the most. Um, yes, we are recording this webinar, and yes, you will get playback information tomorrow. Um, but the next question I have is for Heather. Heather, um, creating, a, creating an ontology would be quite a bit of work, and so how does one decide that an ontology would be useful? And what kind of, when, as a subpart to that, what question should an information worker, subject matter expert, whoever's building these, should they ask themselves to determine if a knowledge, if an ontology should be employed or a simpler knowledge organization system? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's it's really what you want to enable the users to do. All right, I, I, actually, that's the question, to do. Now, if, they, if users are to get information, they just want to find, just find, then you know it's possible that's enough. But if they're trying to do something, maybe uh, discover. Yeah, that's why this is called discovery. I mean, and answer questions that are more complex, that have different parts to them, not just I need to find this on this topic, because taxonomies are about topics, and ontologies link uh, to one thing to another. Right. That's a, a short, simple answer, but I know we have we have more questions. Okay, thank you, Heather. So this is a question for Jim. Can you give an example of a company or a type of company and how they use Semaphore to improve business outcomes? 
interesting question. Um, well, I would think that all of our clients uh, <laughs> use Semaphore to uh, achieve business outcomes. Um, uh, I'll speak to, you know, my favorite examples are in the life sciences. So this is, you know, our pharma clients um, use Semaphore in a lot of different ways, even within the same organization. They may be managing uh, their uh, ontologies. Uh, and they bring them all into Semaphore, and some of them are in uh, other formats um, from different organizations. But Semaphore is the main repository for them. And you know, they, uh, especially in terms of the ones that they need to use for uh, the other capabilities of Semaphore, like content classification, uh, fact extraction. Um, they're uh, one great example, uh, you know, uh, this same organization is, is building uh, uh, portals, subject-specific portals uh, for a, a part of their organization. And it's a great example of what I was just talking through, where they're taking these external vocabularies, these large ontologies, and not only building uh, models like I just uh, demonstrated specific to their business, uh, Semaphore has a lot of capabilities in terms of configuring it to look for information in very specific ways. So they have very specific questions they're asking about therapeutic areas and the drugs and their competitors and the market in general. And so they mine a lot of content for clues that helps them make decisions in that regard. And so Semaphore, uh, they've done work in Semaphore to, to tailor, it's not just saying a document is about a topic, but uh, you know, more something more specific. It is about you know this competitor I don't know the specifics, it's kind of proprietary, but this, this competitor uh, is looking into this specific uh, pathway and that's some, a pathway that we're looking at. So that type of very specific information that's, that's uh, relevant to their business. Okay, um, this here's another one. We have lots of questions I'm just kind of scrolling through here. Um, here's one for Heather. Heather, when should you use a taxonomy versus an ontology? Kind of a basic okay. one, but a good one. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit similar to the previous question. Um, and I, but it, maybe I, I should get into more examples. I mean, at ta taxonomies, we uh, see them in um, like e-commerce. It's quite common. You know, you're looking for products by uh, categories and by characteristics. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, and in, in intranets, I've I've done some in that too, uh, where you know you're kind of just you know browsing through different documents, and uh, where an ontology, and I I do think certainly in the uh, pharmaceutical industry where you're trying to figure out all these relations between the the chemicals and the products and the what it's to treat and what are the side effects and you know what are the regulations and you know there's all this com all this complexity <laughs> to it um, and uh, other examples might be an expert finder too might be good because you're you're linking you know people but what is their area of expertise and where are they located and what have they published and uh, who what group are they in and who else do they work with you know, that. That's why we remember that one of those generic ones was called friend of a friend, you know, who's related to, to who. And that's another ex example where an ontology would, would be better. Um, I mean, we kind of missed thesaurus in between. Thesaurus are kind of deep uh, in, in a subject area. So that's like when you were doing literature retrieval in a, a certain discipline, a thesauri are good. But there, I mean, there are many other, many other uses too. Uh, but, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time for, we don't have time for any additional questions. Um, but I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And I want to thank both you, Jim and Heather, for sharing your time and expertise. It's been great having you both. Um, everyone, have a great day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.